Hello Corona developers. In this video I'm going to show you the virtual controller example in Corona Simulator. Alright, so first thing you need is make sure you have the via SDK examples and then hop into the Corona section and you'll find the virtual controller example. And if you followed the previous videos you can drag the virtual controller example over to Outlaw and that'll cause it to appear over here and we can look at the contents of the project here. So as far as all these PNG files are concerned, they're just images for the sprites to show a virtual controller. And if we open up this folder, you open up the main Lua script in the Corona simulator, you'll see this. And in this example, it shows four virtual controllers and the labels that say unknown We'll just say unknown until you hit a button or move an axis, and then it'll grab the name of the controller and it'll say Wii controller or Xbox receiver or PlayStation controller, that kind of thing. On the label, when you hit buttons on the controllers, it's going to highlight the different buttons and triggers and move the axes around. And that's the extent of uh, the sample. It's just pure Lewis scripts and some images and the buttons are basically toggling on and off sprites and I'll show you how that works now. Okay, so if, if we drill down into the Lua script uh, it, it all starts at, on the main Lua script. Main Lua is the entry point for the example. I've stuck with this this kind of format. It shows the, the license info. Put the name of the Lua script at the top so you know what file you're editing. And then to, I've organized the example and just several sections by using uh, essentially Lua script includes by using these acquires. I've moved all the uh, global variables into a script called globals. Helpers contain some uh, fading scripts for fading in and out the different sprites on the controller. Okay and then we have inputs. Inputs is where you'll find the button and axis handling events. And then the UI script has UI related items. Alright, so let's let's look at each one here. Globals is pretty straightforward. The virtual controller only has one global variable here. Just the uh, table of controllers. Back to main here. And we have our helper script, so I'll jump into the helper's Lua script here. The helper's Lua script has several different helper functions. So here we have an update sprite method, a sprite fade out for fading out sprites, fading in sprites, and then an auto fade so that it's gonna th this is for the case for um, like an axis because it's got it's got a, a grayed out sprite and it's got a active sprite and it'll cross fade those. Then I've got a helper function to do an inverse fade. So let's start with the update sprite script. The update sprite defines a function. This function takes a sprite object. It takes an x and y position of that sprite object. The x and y scale affect the scale of that sprite. And then the alpha channel, which we use to fade the sprite in and out. There are several other helper functions. Sprite fade out takes, also takes the sprite object and it does a transition between a full alpha and it uses the transition to to fade out the alpha to zero over 500 milliseconds. Fade in works the opposite way. It takes a sprite object again. It starts with a blacked out, completely transparent sprite and fades it in to full opacity over 500 milliseconds. Sprite fade auto takes a phase. Now the, the phase, I'll talk about that more on the input script, but phase is basically up or down as a string to indicate the button state and then this also takes a sprite object so depending on whether the button has been pressed down or is being released it's going to fade in or fade out a sprite and then sprite fade auto inverse also takes a phase and a sprite object and if the button is going up it's going to fade in the sprite when you release a button or if you're pushing down the button it's going to fade the sprite out these are your convenience functions to help with the fading in and out of sprites. Alright, that's the helper script.
Now back to main. Now inputs. Inputs handle the input events for access and buttons. Now if we look at the bottom of the main script, there's this add event listener for key and access. This basically registers uh, key, key events and it will call our inputs on key event. And if it has the access event, it's going to call the function inputs dot on access event. Now let's look at inputs Lewis script. This Lewis script also includes another Lewis script to get access to the global variables. Now the global variables were just the table of controllers. And also it has a, a reference to the helper scripts so that the, when the input events fire it can also fade in and out sprites. Alright, so here we define the on access event. It's a function. And it takes an event, which is an on key event. And if we go down, there's also another function that's defined, the on key event. It takes a function and event. So we have a on key event and an on access event. Okay. Now for the access on the controller, so the left stick, right stick, left trigger, right trigger. First thing we want to check, just it's good to have error checking. Um, Lewis script has nil for null. So basically, if the controller table is not defined, then it's going to throw an error that says, I don't know about the global controllers. And it'll just return and skip any errors instead of crashing or throwing an exception. I have a if block on if the device exists, then it prints some stuff, and that's just there. Uh, when I set up controllers, I want to like push buttons and figure out what the mappings are. It's not necessarily used by the example, but it's there to uncomment, and you can see in your logcat what's going on. It will print if the device doesn't exist that your device is nil. Alright, so events. Event is the key event and access event, and it's got a field on it called device. That's the input device. And on that input device, it has a descriptor. And this is how we tell which joystick it is, 1 through 4. And I set an index, which I use in the global controllers to access the table to get the right controller, which gives me references to the sprite objects and some other details, and the text labels. All right, so we use this index to access the global controllers by index and we get the controller back. We log an error if if the controller's not found. And then we're into the access scalar thing. The access scalar is a constant integer, which we use because the controller accesses are normalized. It's gonna return values from minus one to one. And if we just moved the sprite one pixel when removing the sticks around you really wouldn't see much of a difference. So we just use the scalar to multiply by the normalized value to get values from minus 10 to positive 10 when you're moving the stick around so that you see a more pronounced movement of the axis on the virtual controller. Okay, so in an access event we want to access the normalized value of the event. This is the access value that represents the minus 1 to positive 1 of the axis. And in this example, we have a little bit of dead zone checking. Let's look back in the Corona example. Okay, so here's our Corona example. And you'll notice the image is looking at the controller from, you know, from behind to the right a little bit. Now, when you're doing axis events and you're pushing in various directions, we have to orient the input to match the perspective that we're seeing these, this image of the controller. So, we're taking this axis event and basically rotating it by 135 degrees on the Y, assuming Y is up, so that our input axis events that we see on the TV match the orientation of the controller. So it's, it's just rotating, and this is a simple calculation to convert the 135 degrees to radians, and then we get the cosine value and the sine value of that, which we use to rotate the controller which we use to rotate the controller input. Alright, so again, we have an access event, and it's got an access field on it, 
and for access events we need to know what controller index we're dealing with. There's a number field to identify the access and in this case 1 represents the left stick X horizontal on the OUYA controller. First thing I do is I store the value uh, because since we're rotating the the input I don't want to store the rotated input I want to store the original value. Because we're dealing with a rotated controller when one axis changes on the controller we also have to use the X and the Y components due to the rotation. Anytime we get an access value we're storing the value for the corresponding event. So if you if you move the X event we store that so that later when you move the Y event you can rotate the the last value that was seen. Okay so here's a little temp calculation we're accessing the X and Y component of the input and we're doing a little math here to rotate rotate the input and then update the sprite. I'll go into detail about how this works when I cover the controller object but essentially this function is storing the input the X and the Y components for an axis because when you've rotated something you need to refer back to the original input not your rotated input and so it's storing that in the global table which has the controller so you're storing it in the controller object for accessing it later in the event so like when you're moving the x-axis you're referencing the x and the y component because it's rotated I'll revisit part of this math after I've covered the controller and essentially it's setting the x and y component for two different versions of the stick sprite here all the other conditions that reference an axis are basically the same as this first one so first figure out what the number is and that's the left y stick it's the same calculation if it's axis 4 that's the right stick horizontal axis 5 the right vertical stick we don't really do anything with the left and right triggers but they're defined here and you'll find this the same information also in the documentation all right and then there's the key event it's the same basic logic to validate that the global controllers is valid some printing for when you're setting up new controllers you need to see some data uh, print an error if the event device isn't defined use the device descriptor to figure out which controller you're dealing with use the index to access the global controllers to get the the controller sprites for that index here if we push a different button uh, we have the controller has a reference to a text label where we display the name of the device now on key events there's a key name field and that name will tell you what kind of button the key name will describe the button that's being pressed the phase will tell you whether the button is being pushed down or released. We can detect if the system button was pressed to do some sort of pause action. There's key names for the different D-pads. There's an event for the left stick button and the right stick button. And then the OUYA buttons here. Now, the right joystick button is tricky because there's two different sprites that represent the button because it's moving with it when it's pressed or not pressed. Otherwise, it would be in the, the background image because those those buttons don't move. They didn't need to dynamically move around. Then we have the, the bumper button, the left trigger, the right bumper, and the right trigger. Alright, so that, that's the basics of the input. Now, back to the main script. We also include this UI script. The UI Lua script provides a create controller function. And basically, this is called by main to construct each virtual controller. So you see here in main, we have the global controllers table and we create four different controllers. The first parameter is the index of the controller. The second parameter is the X component for where to place that virtual controller on the screen. Third parameter is the Y component for where to pl place on the screen, so you have X and Y there. Fourth and fifth component are the X and Y scale of the sprite in the UI script. So here we go. We have the player index, the X and Y component, where to position it, and the X and Y scale of the sprite. So this function creates a sprite object and here we're assigning some fields on that object. So we take the arguments that are passed in and assign it to the sprite object. We initialize the left and right stick access values. Line 40 actually uses the Corona SDK here to construct sprites from the PNG images. So when you call display new image, it loads that image as a sprite object and we set it into these different fields like controller, 
so that we can manipulate the alpha channel and, and move it around. So this whole block is, is accessing and loading the images. And then we have our text label that displays the controller name below the, the virtual controller. Now, this X and Y position that we're passing in is the anchor point of the controller. And all these other images are offsetting from that position. We use the anchor point to position all the controllers at the same spot. You'll see with all the sprite images that they're all anchored and scaled the same as the controller object. So they all are positioned at the same x, x and y coordinate and they have the same x and y scale. And the final thing is to return the sprite object so that it can be stored in the global list of controllers. Now this is really the only UI that was was needed because the controllers don't move other than moving the individual axes. Now there's fade operations but that's handled by the helpers and then it's just back to the inputs here and these axis events are using the helpers to fade the different buttons and these buttons are basically sprite objects and it's it's fading the alpha channel of each sprite to get the virtual controller experience. So this input handler is first it's checking for the button name so you figure out what button you're, you're dealing with and then it's passing the phase of the input over to the sprite helpers and then the sprite helpers use that the phase to figure out if it's being pressed or not pressed to either fade in the alpha or fade out the alpha channel of the sprite texture which we pass as the second argument. All the different buttons and controls work basically the same way except for the the left and right stick are a special case because the buttons aren't part of the background. Alright, so back to axes now. So for the axis event, one more time to recap this this rotation logic here. Alright, so we have an event. This is an axis event. We use the axis field and number to figure out which axis we are so we know we're the left stick. Okay, for the axis events, because it's rotated, we need to store the original input values because when we move one X or Y component, we're also moving the other component. We use the original X and Y components in the math that's used to rotate the axis to align with the camera perspective of the controller that you see on the screen. And let's look at the math here. So how does this math work? All right, so we have the anchor point of the controller where we position the controller. Then we want to offset when you move the axis with the controller, but we also rotate it. So again, the scalar is used because we want to move it more than one pixel. We want to move it 10 times more than a pixel to see a, more of a visual change. So we multiply that scalar times the rotated value for the x and y using this x times cosine minus y times cosine to get the actual rotated position of the axis on the controller. Once we figure out what the rotated x and y components are for the sprites, then we assign it to the sprite's position. So we have our controller object, the sprite object, and then it has a reference to the left stick inactive and left stick active sprites. And sprites have an x and y component where we can assign their positions and move the stick as the input happens. This has been an overview of the virtual controller example for Corona. Stay tuned to more videos and thanks for watching.